Yep. All right, great. <clears throat> good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, wherever you are, uh, we, have, we have a few people from, from abroad, so um, it's morning where I am, but I uh, just wanted to say hello. My name is Corey Osis, um, postdoc at Duke. Um, been working with AFLO for a number of years now, um, and we're gonna, this session is going to focus on density functional theory. It's a very uh, concise introduction. By no means is it going to be very rigorous. That requires at least a, at least a, a semester, if not more, of of of, uh, of, of class physics teaching. Um, so, and we're, the the goal is to is to is to get to the point where you can understand how to use VASP, which is a a DFT program, um, the one that we're going to be using in this session. Um, you can think of this 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 introduction as kind of trying to learn how to how to drive a car. You know, you don't need to know the internals of the engine and all those sort of things. I'm going to show you where the steering wheel is. The pedals, the 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 stick to change uh, from reverse to to drive, all that stuff. But the goal is not to really go into the internal; it's just to get you to the point where you can use VASP and understand some of the output that you get from the program. Um, feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, this is this is going to be very informal. Um, my my goal is to uh, I'm going to give a a very short introduction. So you can think of this as kind of like a, a short lecture. Um, for about 20, <clears throat> for about 25 minutes. Um, we're going to go through an example um, together, very slowly going through the output, the input, how to run everything. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to do ver uh, various examples together in, in, in breakout groups. So this session is going to go um, until about, I think, 1230. Then we break for lunch. We come back uh, at two, one or two. We come back at, yeah, we come back at two. Um, and then we're going to do another worked example, and that that next session is going to be mostly in the breakout groups. Um, and so we'll have those those exercises we'll work together. Uh, the goal is that in, in that more intimate setting, you can ask questions and really work through the examples. All right, let's get started. Um, so <clears throat> I want to start with a quote from uh, from Dirac from a paper in 1929. I think this is a great uh, um, motivation for the work we're doing here today. Um, it comes from a paper called Quantum Mechanics of Many Electronic Systems, Many Electron Systems. All right, so here's the quote. The underlying physical law is necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. It, it therefore becomes desirable that approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be developed, which can lead to an explanation of the main features of complex atomic systems without too much computation. So you can see this paper was written in 1929, so you know almost almost 100 years ago, um, and we're still dealing with this challenge of you know the the, the well. I mean, listen, I, I sort of disagree that the, a large part, the, the, the or maybe the whole part of physics and chemistry, there's still a lot of development in theory, but but definitely there's a, there's this this challenge of of applying. Uh, these equations um, in a way that, that that can actually be done in a practical sense. That's the real challenge. And we've been doing that ever since. So that's what we're going to be learning about today. All right. So we're going to start with uh, the, the canonical equation, uh, uh, Schrodinger's equation here. Uh, so the time independent many body Schrodinger equation, we have it here. Um, we have a wave function. This is the, 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 the main focus of this equation. Um, this is a uh, many body and it's, it's spinless. So I'm not going to incorporate, um, I'm not going to complicate it with the extra spin variable, but it's a many body entangled wave function. So you can think of each of these variables as, as representing a different uh, object. So this is electron one. These are the coordinates of electron one, electron two, uh, ion one, ion two. You can think of this wave function as encompassing all the information of the universe. Okay, so uh, all of these variables are entangled into one function. Uh, we have a Hamiltonian operator, which is acting on the wave function, um, and that's going to return back the energy in the wave function. Okay, so this is sort of our standard eigenvalue problem. Um, the Hamiltonian here, I give, I give a, a, a various, I, I break it down into its various components. The Hamiltonian in general encapsulates uh, the kinetic and the potential energy terms. Okay, so um, here we have, we have this term here, which is the kinetic energy of the electrons. 
the kinetic energy of the ions or the nuclei. We have the interactions of the electrons together. Um, we have the electron nuclear interaction and then the nuclear nuclear interaction. Okay, so this, this equation in general is very difficult to, to solve, especially for this many body wave function. Um, I would say that one of the more complicated terms is this one, the electron electron term, um, where you have instantaneous in interactions of electrons that are moving at relativistic speeds, their motions are correlated. Um, this, this term is very challenging. Um, but in general, this, this, is, this, this requires, this is, this is a very difficult uh, equation to solve. So we need to take certain approximations. And the next few slides, I wanna walk through the various approximations um, and shortcuts we take to get this to a point where we can, actually, we can actually run the equations on a computer. So the first approximation that's almost always taken uh, is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. It's called the clamp nuclei. So the idea is very simple. The protons are much larger than the electrons, which are whizzing by around the, the, the electrons. You can think of this as, you know, if you're driving on the highway and you see a, a motorcycle coming by speeding very quickly. For those of you that have been on that motorcycle, I hope, I hope not too many, but from the perspective of the motorcycle that's going very fast, uh, it looks like the cars are not moving. Okay, so from that perspective, you can think of the nuclei just clamped down, they're not moving. So the nuclei are not gonna have any kinetic energy and the potential energy between nuclei becomes a constant, okay? So we can reduce down the uh, Hamiltonian to just that which focuses on the electrons. So we have this term here, which is the kinetic energy of the, of the electrons. We have the, uh, the, the potential energy between the electrons, still very challenging term, and then the uh, electron nuclear interactions, okay? And so the total energy that we should get from this equation, this, this term here that we're looking to solve, um, we're going to get back the energy of the electrons, and then this term here, the, the nuclear nuclear interaction becomes just the term that we add on afterwards, after we solve our, our, our eigenvalue problem. All right, so um, this problem is still very difficult because we have this, this entangled wave function, this many body wave function. Um, just to give you an example of how challenging and cost, costly and expensive this, it is to solve this, um, it, it's, it, well, the idea here is that the computational cost grows exponentially with dimensionality. So we're looking at something where if we, we're solving this on a grid of coordinates, that, that, that the cost is going to grow with the, you know, the size of the grid exponentially to the 3n. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Let's give some examples. So let's say we have a 3D grid in, 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 you know, in all three directions and we do 10 points, which is not very much along each direction. The cost factor relative to one electron in one dimension if we're modeling uh, carbon dioxide, a carbon dioxide molecule, uh, we plug in all the variables. We have 10 to the three, this is the grid. We have three dimensions and we multiply by the number of electrons. We're gonna get something that is 10 to the 198. Okay, so some ridiculous factor. That's just for carbon dioxide. If we wanna model a, a nano cluster of hundred platinum atoms, we plug in all of our relevant uh, um, uh, parameters here and we get something 10 to the 70,000. So it's still a ridiculous burden. This is really intractable. We can't solve it. So this is where density functional theory comes in. All right. So there's, there, the, the, this is a very complicated topic. We're not going to cover every detail of DFT, but there are two major theories that are sort of the pillars of this, of this theory. Uh, the first was developed in 1964 by Home, Holmberg and Cohn. Um, and the concept's pretty simple. Um, and, and actually the derivation is also very simple as well. It's surprising, deceptively simple. Um, the idea is very simple. So we have, we, we have our energy, which is a functional of the wave function. That's what I described earlier by, the, by showing you the Schrodinger equation. So the idea here is that the wave function is a function. And so the energy becomes a functional of that. It's dependent on information of the wave function. Homer Cohn proved that, um, that, we, that we can basically take this out for the ground state, we can change this, this basic variable, and we can instead understand the energy as a function, functional of the, den of the charge density. Okay, so why is this important? Because the wave function depends on all these coordinates. Okay, just the simple electron wave function depends on coordinates of electron one, electron two, and all the electrons in space. But if we can change the variable to the charge density instead, we go from having n variables here, three n variables, to having something that's just uh, 
three variables. Okay, so the charge density is just you know x, y, and z. Okay, problem with this theory is that it doesn't define the exact form of the equations. Okay, so we have this. We 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 can show that this is possible. We don't know how. To, we don't exactly know what the equations are to do that. So Cohn Sham, a year later, 1965, offered a useful reformulation that gives us a way to access some of these equations, or in a way that that we can approximate these equations. So to solve for the energy, which is what we're interested in, here we have our wave function. We have our operator acting on that wave function to solve for the energy. We need to we need to take we need to act we need to have that operator act on the wave function. We need to multiply by the complex conjugate of the wave function and then integrate over all space. Okay. So what's implied by um, Holmberg Cohn is that there that that basically we're going to have three terms. We're going to have a kinetic energy term. They're all going to be dependent on the charge density. So we have a kinetic energy term, the electron electron interaction. And then this term here, which is the, the nucleus, nuclear electron interaction. So we, we, we generally look at this as the external potential acting on the system. Okay, the external potential of the uh, uh, acting on the electrons. All right, so uh, Cone Sham said, okay, well, this, this is a very difficult problem. Let's break it up into terms that we know we can solve. And then let's put all the stuff we don't know how to solve into a term that, that uh, you'll see is called the garbage collection term. So the full kinetic energy, very difficult to solve, but we can get a lot of the kinetic energy by looking at a slightly different problem. We want to look at the term that describes n non-interacting particles. So you can imagine the kinetic energy is going to involve uh, a piece of, you know, if we have n interacting particles, there's going to be a piece of it that, that that's going to be described as a system of non-interacting particles. And then the piece that we would get if we describe the full in, uh, n interacting particle system. So we can, we can break that piece off. We can say, okay, let's look at the part that describes the n non-interacting non-interact, particles. Um, in terms of the electron-electron interaction, I said this, 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 this is a very complicated part, a piece of the, of the equation. We're going to look at a, at a piece of that part of that interaction. Um, we're going to we're going to look at the so for every electron, we're going to look we're going to look at the interaction of the electron with sort of a constant uh, uh, electric potential background. Okay, so this is called the classic Coulomb energy, um, and so that's what this term is describing here. But what are we really missing? We're missing we're, we're missing a few pieces, but one of them you can think of them as being. The, uh, the, the full correlated motion of the electrons whizzing by each other, being constantly repulsed by each other, moving at relativistic speeds, that, that interaction, that piece of it, that's going to be very difficult to model. So we're not going to model electron versus electron. We're going to model electron to a constant uh, background field. We have our, our uh, electron nuclear interaction here. And then we put all the pieces we don't know into one term that's called the exchange correlation functional. Okay, so this is our garbage collection term. What does this piece contain? It contains the piece of the kinetic energy that we can't describe with n non-interacting particles. Uh, and then we have the, the rest of the electron-electron interaction that we don't get by modeling our system as electron versus electron uh, interacting with a constant background potential. Um, okay, so there's, there's a few key pieces to that. So there's the, there's the residual of the, of the kinetic energy um, there's what's called the exchange energy. This is a purely quantum mechanical effects effect, and it comes from the fact that electrons are both fermions and they're, um, they're indistinguishable. They're identical particles. So you can think of this loosely as, the, as, as sort of the energy that we get, the energy that's released when you have two same spin um, particles um, swapping positions, okay? Um, we have the correlation energy. So this is the, the, the fully correlated motions of two uh, electrons that are constantly being feeling the repulsion of each other, uh, you know, moving very quickly relative to each other. That's that correlation term. And then we have what's called the self-interaction. And it comes from this idea that we're modeling our system as an electron interacting with a background field. But if you think about it, this average background field includes the electron that we're, that's interacting with it. So there's some sort of double counting going on there. And that's that piece, so the exchange correlation term exactly is needs to account for that. Okay, so um, so that's that's uh, those are some of those pieces that the garbage collections included. Um, so really everything we don't know how to model. So 
if we look at these, if, if we put all of those pieces inside of that term, and we really focus on, on, on modeling this N non-interacting particle system, we get, uh, we get, a, uh, we get a series of, of equations that, that, that sort of, if you squint, they kind of look like the, the, the Schrodinger equation that we, we had up earlier, okay? So we have N one electron equations. So we have an operator acting on these cone sham orbitals, and we're gonna get back the energies of these orbitals times the orbital, the orbital function, okay? Um, so it, deceptively or subtly, it looks like the eigen, eigenvalue, eigenfunction uh, equation we had earlier, but it's not, okay? It's very important that it's not. So if, in order for it to be an eigenvalue, fun, uh, an eigenvalue problem, we need to have an operator that's acting on a function and we return back a scalar times that function. The problem is that the operator contains the function that it's operating on. Okay, so this V effective term contains the charge density, which is dependent on these, these uh, cone sham orbitals. And also the, the operator, that, the operator that's, that's made up of this, this garbage collection term, this exchange correlation term, that's also gonna be dependent on, on the cone sham orbitals. So this operator is dependent on the thing it's acting on. Okay, so it's, it's a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. The way we solve it is, is we do an iterative approach, okay, self-consistent approach to this. So this, this uh, I'm just giving you a, speak, uh, a sneak peek, but this, this uh, iterative solution or approach that we're doing, this can be seen in what's called the OSSICAR file. So when we're doing our calculations later, look out for, I'm going to show you the OSSICAR file, and you're going to see that we're going to solve, you're going to see the steps of what we're solving iteratively to get to this solution. So what is, what is this iterative approach? We're gonna start off with a trial solution for these cone sham orbitals, and we're gonna plug it into the operator, effectively fixing it. Okay, so we, we start with a trial solution, we plug it into this operator, and now if we fix the operator, we can solve this as a normal eigen, eigenvalue, eigenval, eigenfunction uh, uh, problem. And we can solve for these, um, these cone sham orbitals, okay? And then we compare the trial solution that we had for the cone sham orbitals, which we plugged into the operator, and that which we solved from our eigenvalue function, eigenvalue problem. And while they're different, while the one that we plugged in and the one that we solved for are different, we're going to update the one that we solved for. We're going to take the solutions we got here. We're going to plug it back into the operator, fix the operator, and then solve the eigenvalue problem again. Okay, and so that you can see the iteration. We're going to solve for this solution, plug it back into the operator, fixing the operator, and then solve the eigenvalue function, okay? And the point is that as we keep doing this, the two, the two psi and psi prime are, event, are gonna approach equality. And then uh, at given a certain threshold, we can cut off the, the iterative approach. We can say, okay, now we've, we've basically come to a, a converged solution. Okay. So that's, that's the very, very high level idea of DFT. Um, okay, so what, how, how much does it cut down in terms of cost? So we go from this exponential, we have our grid exponentially the, uh, times the number of, of, let's say the number of electrons in our system, you know, times three dimensions. We, we go from a dependence of that when we have a full many body wave function to one where it's multiplicative. So it's, it's so the cost now is, is multiplicative in terms of the number of electrons in the system times times the n grid, you know, cubed. So, problem is that there are still many electrons in any given material we want to model. Okay, so the number of electrons in in some sort of macroscopic material is still going to be on the order of moles, so we're ten to the twenty three electrons. So, what is the next approximation or or level of, of theory that we're going to take? We're gonna we're gonna really start from the fundamentals here of, of of crystals, okay. So crystal, if we if we're working with crystal systems, we can really reduce the cost even further, okay. So with crystal systems, um, where we have periodic boundary conditions and we have a system that is uh, that has a, a repeating unit, okay. So we we can basically look at our macroscopic material, and we know that it's made up of tiny uh, repeating units, one repeating unit repeated in all three dimensions. We can take our focus from this big macroscopic material and just focus in and hone in on the repeating unit, assuming periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so we can go from something that's macroscopic to something that's, you know, on the order of, of, of nanometers. 
So the idea here is, is it's, this is very important. The we need to have translational periodicity, which means that this, this unit, this, this, this basic unit is repeated in three dimensions. And then, you know, it has, it's gonna be repeated in all three dimensions. So the fact that we have something that's that has a repeating, uh, repeating unit and it's re it repeats in, in, in three dimensions, you know, in, 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 you know it, it repeats. Whenever you hear that something repeats, I want you to think of, of the Fourier transform, okay? So the analogy here is time and frequency, okay? So we're, instead of working in, in time, in the time space, we're, we're looking at the spatial coordinates. And so we're gonna look at reciprocal space. Okay, so the idea here is that we have a real space crystal and we understand that it repeats in, 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 you know, in, in all three dimensions for in, in, you know, in, in an infinite sense. And so we're gonna capture that repeating, that, that re periodicity in, in reciprocal space. Okay, so it's modeled by, by what's called plane waves. Okay, sine and cosine, just like how we model um, um, things when we're working in the frequency domain, you know, time versus frequency, we're gonna be looking at the reciprocal space, which is sort of the frequency domain for, for space here. So um, we have plane waves, um, which is, you know, you know, exponential to I, which is sine and cosine times this K times the lattice vectors, okay? K here is called the block vector and it lives in the frequency domain. And so the idea here is we have a reciprocal, we have a real space crystal and then we're gonna be able to move to the reciprocal space, which captures all of this period periodicity in the system. Okay, and so we're gonna have an equivalent reciprocal uh, uh, lattice. Um, and this, 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 this is called the, the Breland zone. Okay, so this, 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 um, this minimal building block in the reciprocal space, this is called the, fir the first Breland zone. Okay, and then we have, we have our, you know, we, I showed you an equation R before, which, which is made up of, of uh, the lattice vectors A, B, and C. We're going to have an equivalent in the reciprocal space. Um, we, so we're going to call this G instead of R. So G and R are, are, are equivalents in, in, in the respective spaces. We have this equation here, which dictates how the two spaces are related. Okay, And this equation here gives us how we solve for the reciprocal lattice vectors, B1, B2, B3. Um, which is um, um, commence, or it's going to be sort of the, the, the equivalent of A1, A2, A3, the, the real space lattice vectors. Okay, so now that we have this, rep this understanding of how to model periodicity in spatial coordinates, we have to work in the reciprocal space. Um, we're going to work, we're going to, we need to understand Bloch's theorem. Okay, so we want to understand how these orbitals function in this periodics, uh, um, um, in this periodic model. So we have our function, our orbitals. You can think of them as, their, as the or, this function here, which is going to be repeating as, you know, as we shift by a reciprocal lattice vector, we need to have an understanding that this, this, how is this, how, how are the orbitals gonna change as we shift by a, a repeating unit? So if we shift by a lattice vector, we're gonna get back a, a, um, a piece of it that, that, um, that, is, that you can think of as, as the piece that starts at the origin and then multiplied by a plane wave. Okay, so this is our, our basis set, the plane waves here. So this piece here that, that, that is, you can think of it as sitting at the origin, this is gonna have two components to it. There's a lattice periodic uh, uh, function here. So this, this repeats every, um, every, every time we shift by a lattice vector. Okay, so I have it here. So this lattice periodic, if we shift by a lattice vector, we, we get back the same function. So it's, a, so it's a periodic function and it's multiplied again by a plane wave within that Breland zone. Okay, so K here, K here is constrained to the first Breland zone or, or to within the first repeating unit in the reciprocal space. So we have two variables here. We have K, which is the block vector. And then we have N that is the band index. So N, the band index is gonna be on the order of the number of electrons in the system. Um, practically speaking, we're, this is a parameter that we have to input into our calculation. We're always gonna to wanna to put uh, the number of bands as larger than the number of electrons. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we basically wanna have, we, we, when, we're, when we're modeling our system, we wanna have at least the number of, of bands that are gonna be occupied and then we want to have some more because otherwise the system won't converge. The calculation won't converge. Okay, so now with this with this understanding of 
of, of how these, these, uh, these systems are gonna work with this K vector, which is in, lives in the, in the reciprocal space, we can now build the basis for how we're gonna model our, 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 our wave functions or our cone sham orbitals. So this lattice periodic system here is gonna be built on plane waves and we have our basis. And so it's gonna be the sum of plane waves times a coefficient, okay? So relative weighting for each plane wave. And this plane wave here is dependent on the reciprocal lattice vectors. To model our cone sham orbitals, the basis that we're working in is gonna be uh, plane waves, which has the reciprocal lattice vector times the block vector. And then here, what we're interested in solving based on our basis of plane waves are these coefficients. What are the, co the, the weightings for each plane wave for modeling our system? So uh, if you remember from, uh, from, from, from calculus, or, um, or from infinite series, you know that this, so plane waves make up a, a, a full basis. So you can model any function making up as a sum of plane waves, but practically speaking, our, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna have infinite terms. We're gonna truncate our series. Um, and so our basis set is going to include terms up to what's called an energy cutoff. So each plane wave has an associated energy term associate, uh, associated with it. And that's, that's quantified by this here, this term up here. This is, this is actually in units of energy. And so um, and, and we're gonna actually put in our input files, how many terms we want in our system. And the way we do it is by establishing an energy cutoff. So we say, we're gonna give it an energy num a number, an, an, an energy number, and that establishes how many terms we want in our basis set. Okay. so. Uh, we're going to be solving for uh, these uh, um, plane waves, and and the idea is that um, the any any property that we're interested in of the material is going to be solved by integrating over this Brillouin zone. Okay, so this Brillouin zone captures the periodicity of the system, and we're going to integrate over the Brillouin zone uh, these plane waves. And that's going to give us our, 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 our relative property. So I'll give you an example of one property that we're interested in solving. That's the charge density. So the charge density is an integral over the Brillouin zone. We're going to sum over all of the band indices. Um, here we have our wave functions, which is made up of plane waves, as I described in the slide before. And we're going we're gonna to multiply by the occupancy of those orbitals. Okay, so if, if the orbital is occupied, then it gets one. If it's not occupied, it gets zero. And that gives us our charge density. Okay, so all of the properties we want to solve, charge density, um, 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 you know, the, the number of electrons, all these things are made up of integrals in the Brillouin zone. Okay, so that's the, this is the, the major problem we're focusing on. We want, to, we want to solve, how do we solve these integrals computationally? So we're gonna convert this integral in general um, to a sum over discrete points in the, of K points, okay, in the Brillouin zone. So we're gonna take, we're gonna partition our K point, our, our Brillouin zone into particular points. We're gonna make up a grid. We're gonna solve for these functions at these grid, at these grid points, and then we're gonna do a big sum. So what does that mean? How, how can we just convert our sum, or, or convert our integral into a sum? Well, if you remember from calculus, you know, one of the ways that we approximate integrals is by doing the trapezoidal method. Remember, we take, we take our integral, we kind of make a box, and we, we, we take the sum under the, the area of the box, and we model that as our integral. And if you, if you think about it, the trapezoidal method is not any different here. What we're doing is we're going to solve our function at particular points, and, and then we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to multiply that by a weighting, which gives us our area. And then that's going to represent or approximate our integral. So that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're gonna we're so how do we make this grid in K space in reciprocal space um, using what well, we're, we're, we're going to be focusing on VASP? So there's two options that we're going to be that 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 VASP offers for creating this K grid. Okay, so the first and the one that we're going to focus on is called the is an automatic scheme. There's two automatic scheme schemes is called Moncourse Pack and Gamma Centered. So you can, you can ask VASP to create the grid for you, or you can create the grid yourself and offer the, the, the relative weights. Okay, so you can solve it for yourself and then give the weights. We're gonna be focusing on the, on the automatic schemes. So Moncourse Pack 
um, is really just an, if you, you know, you can think of having a, a, a box here. Uh, so let's imagine this is our reciprocal space. A reciprocal space is just a 2D square. And we're going to break up this square into an equally spaced mesh. Okay, so that's all that Moncourse Pack is doing. The only subtlety is that Moncourse Pack generally does not include the origin. So that's what separates Moncourse Pack from gamma centered. One of the reasons we don't include gamma is because gamma is sort of an outlier. Okay, so gamma being the origin of the reciprocal space. Okay, so um, the origin of reciprocal space is called gamma. And, and so in some sense, gamma is a, a very symmetric point in the reciprocal space. And so it's an outlier. It's going to have a very high weighting. Um, and so, it, you know, to, in order to, 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 to sort of compensate for that, or, and also to save resources, you know, because at some point, you know, if we include more K points, we're going to have more, it's more computation demanding. Um, it was very common to exclude gamma and to shift our grid. So we didn't include gamma. However, I'm going to present in the next slide that this, this is going to introduce some problems, depending on the symmetry of our lattice. And so we want to stay, we, we always want to choose a gamma centered uh, K mesh. And I'll show you why in, in a few slides. Okay, so let's, let's do a concrete example here. As I was showing you, we have a, a square Brion zone here, 2D Brion zone. We have 16 points. We make an equally, an equally spaced mesh. Um, so what we want to do is we want to, so, you know, this, you can see that there's some symmetry in the fact that we have this square. Um, and if we want to get the, the most reduced set so that we, when we're solving our calculations, we want to get the, we want to reduce our, our, our calculations. So we only have to do the minimum K point. We want to solve our, our, our problem or, or solve for, you know, let's say we're solving for the charge density. We only want to solve it at, at, at the most symmetric points because that's going to be, able, we're going to be able to reduce our calculation. So we want to understand what is the weighting um, for solving uh, the, the, the charge density at any of these particular points. So this is the irreducible Brillouin zone, this wedge here, okay? So of the whole space, this is the symmetrically inequivalent piece. And therefore we want to focus our calculations on that piece and then unfold it in for the rest of the space. And what that means is that we want to account for the fact that this point's going to be equivalent to this point, this point, and this point. So it's going to have a weighting of four, four out of 16. Okay. So that's the idea. So we have three, three, uh, inequivalent points. Um, so let's look at K1 and K2 because they're going to have the same weighting. As I just said, they're going to have, they're going to be degenerate for four points in the reciprocal space. So it's weighting is four out of 16 or one fourth. And then if you look at K3, K3 is actually equivalent to this K point here. So it's gonna have weighting of, of, of eight. So if you count up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight out of 16 are equivalent to that K, K3 K point. So that's a weighting of half. So again, so we're, whatever function we're solving, whether it be the number of electrons, the charge density, whatever property we're solving, we're going to have some sort of integral in the Brillouin zone, and we're going to convert it to solving for the charge density at these particular points with the weightings we just solved, and then we sum. Okay, so that's the idea there. All right, so why is, why is uh, not including the origin so problematic? All right, so here I have an example reciprocal lattice. This is hexagonal. A hex, you know, it just it looks like a, hex, a hexagon here. So this is one one type of, of, of lattice that we can have. Um, and here we we put a grid which is not focused on the origin. And so um, ignore the grid for a second. I want you to look at the hexagonal at the bottom underneath it. We can understand that if we were to rotate this hex, hexagon by sixty degrees, the hexagon is going to look identical as if we didn't rotate. So there's a symmetry there associated with the fact that we can rotate the hexagon by 60 degrees and it's going to look identical. Now, if we try doing that for the grid, we're going to see that the grid is not going to map to the points that uh, it's not going to map onto itself. Okay, so you're going to see that if we try rotating by 60 degrees, we're actually going to get more K points because they didn't map identically to themselves. So you can see here that there's a mismatch in the lattice symmetry and the, the K-grid symmetry. 
And that's going to actually blow up the calculation. And that's what the problem is. And so if instead we fix the origin, we fix the grid on the origin and we perform the same operation, you'll see that all these points are going to map back to points on the grid. So the calculation doesn't blow up. There's a number of grids this, this is known to happen for, FCC, hexagonal, rhombohedral. Um, and so you need to make sure that the K grid has the same symmetry as the Brion zone. And in general, if you don't want to think about that, if you want to understand, hey, do I have FCC? Do I have BCC? Just fix it on gamma. The, 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 the amount of calculation you're saving by excluding gamma is negligible nowadays, okay? So, um, okay. So one of the last concepts I'm going to talk about is called, uh, are called pseudopotentials. And the idea is, is um, the idea is very important. So you can imagine we're solving for these functions that are going to represent where the electrons sit in space. Okay, so here we have our origin, which is going to be the nuclei. Okay, and the electrons, you can think of the origin, you know, that's where the nuclei sits. And then as we extend outward, we're going to see where the electrons can sit in space. So the, elect the, the interactions very close to the core are going to be very high energy. And what that corresponds to in terms of the function is that because we have plane waves, they're going to have a lot of nodes. Okay, so the energy, you can think of the energy of the function being loosely associated with how many turns we have in the function. So we have electrons interacting with nuclei. Okay, so there's a very strong sort of interaction there. And then you have a lot of electrons next to each other. And so they're going to be repulsed. So there's a lot of high energy, high, the, the interactions are very high energy. They're very complicated to model. And then you have a very different scenario as you get out to the valence electrons where the, chemi the actual chemistry of the system is occurring. Um, and so the idea here is that we're, we have, we're gonna have uh, these very complicated interactions which are gonna be very difficult to model at the core. So in some sense, we wanna break up the interactions that happen at the core versus those that happen you know, outside of the core which is where the valence electrons happen and where a large part of the chemistry happens, the bonding. Um, we cannot really solve, if we try to do this full system without breaking up the two of them, um, we, it, it, the, the number of plane waves is going to explode. So the calculation is going to become very large, and we really can't do this exactly beyond lithium. So what we're going to do is we're going to define a cutoff radius below which we model this. We're going we're to have what's called a frozen core. We're going to model that very, very precisely and sort of separately from any of the other calculations we have. And then beyond that, that radius, we're going to model it with, 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 a, with a smooth function or an effective potential, okay? Um, or, um, yeah, we're going to, excuse me, we're going to, we're going to do the opposite. We're replacing the real core with an effective potential in our calculation. And so the valence electrons are really what we want to model in the system. So that cutoff radius uh, is, is, you know, the, if we make it very large, we're going to start to encapsulate some of these electrons that are involved in the chemistry. So the system, the calculation is going to converge very, very quickly, but it's going to be less transferable. So we're going to miss some of those very important interactions. Um, technically speaking, what, what, if we have a very large radius, what we're doing is we're making the pseudo potential softer. Okay, so I don't know if, for those of you in the field and have heard that term, a soft pseudo potential is one that has uh, a very large cutoff radius. Well, we're, we, we've, we're, we're replacing a larger part of that very complicated core with a smooth function. Um, the, the method for creating pseudopotentials that we're going to focus on for, for this, uh, this session is called a projector augmented wave method. Uh, it's, it's, we're not going to go into too many details, but the idea here is that we're going to decompose our all electron or full electron system into three contributions, okay, within which each has their own scope. Outside of that scope, we're going to model it with smooth functions. So we're going to, we're going to have uh, we're, we're, the three scopes are the outside here, the environment. You can think of this as outside of the, the ions. Then we're going to have uh, the actual boundary here. And then sort of inside or, or close, close to the ions. Okay. So those three components are going to, we're going to model each scope in its own perspective, we're going to model that perspective scope. And then outside of it, we're going to model with, uh, with, um, with smooth functions. 
Uh, this approach is, is one of the most accurate for solids and it's the top reason for using VASP. This is why VASP is so popular in the field. All right, the last topic I'm gonna to talk about is called exchange, is the exchange correlation function or this garbage collection term. There's a number of ways, there's a whole zoo of different approximations for the exchange correlation functional. I'm gonna talk about some of the major uh, ideas here. Um, the, I would say the most fundamental exchange correlation function functional is called the local density approximation, where the exchange correlation term here is, um, is the exchange and correlation per particle of a uniform electron gas of density rho. Okay, so we're gonna model our system as a uniform electron gas. And that term is gonna really just be focused as uh, uh, about the local charge density in that area. This approach tends to overbind. Okay, using this method tends to overbind. So what does that mean? That means that our lattice parameters and our volumes are gonna be underestimated because it assumes that uh, charge density is uniform in, around the system. And we know that there are systems where we, the covalent systems are an example where charge density is gonna be focused or clustered around particular regions in space. Okay, and so that's, so the fact that we, we're assuming the charge density exists sort of uniformly ev everywhere, that's going to, uh, um, it's gonna make our lattice parameters very small because everything is more bonded than it should. Um, it's going to overestimate cohesive energies, elastic moduli, phonon frequencies, um, just because of the nature of how the, how the, the, the exchange correlation functional works. Uh, the next level theory is called the generalized gradient approximation, um, where the exchange correlation term here is not just dependent on the, on, on, on the charge density, but also the gradients of the charge density. So we're going to incorporate uh, information of, of how the derivatives look like. This generally improves over LDA, but it can also overcompensate. Um, there are two important examples in the literature. There's the parameter-free GGA developed by Purdue and Wang in 91. And then there's sort of the improved version of that or simplified version developed by Purdue, Burke, and Erzenhoff called PBE uh, after their names. This is what we're gonna be using in our examples. And it's the standard for intermetallic solids. Uh, the next level of theory is called meta-GGAs. And so we're not, gonna, we're not just looking at the charge density or the gradients, but also the second derivatives or the, the Laplacian here. So it's going to incorporate more information of the charge density. Um, and then another important next level theory is called hybrid functionals. Um, and so the idea here is that we're modeling exchange and correlation, right? That's, there's two pieces that we're sort of modeling in this, in this term. Um, correlation is very difficult to model. But exchange, for, at least from a theory perspective, this is something that we can, we can know exactly from, from Hartree-Fock theory. Okay, so if we look at, at the, if we can, if we look at Hartree-Fock theory, we can actually model the exchange part of this term exactly, um, although it's expensive. So um, we incorporate a portion of ex exact exchange from Hartree-Fock. That's what makes it a hybrid functional. There's a, a very famous example. It's a three parameter functional by Beck, Lee, Yang, Parr called B3LIP. Um, and it's the standard for molecules. The three parameters are fitted from experiments. And so um, this also makes it an empirical function because it's not purely from ab initio. It's not purely just from calculation. There's a piece of that's coming from experiment that we're incorporating to this functional. Purdue, um, John Purdue created this picture of a Jacob's ladder of, of, um, of, of, of uh, exchange correlation functionals where the idea here is we have earth and heaven and the different rungs represent uh, higher levels of theory. Uh, in theory, as we climb the rungs, the calculation should become more accurate. Um, it's, 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 some, it's, it's generally true, but what is definitely true is that you're gonna get more expensive. So we have LDA is the lower rung here, GGA, meta GGA is a famous example that's, that's very popular in the literature now, SCAN. Um, we have our hybrid GGAs and then fully non-local. And then you can think of full chemical accuracy as being sort of heaven. All right, so that sort of concludes our, um, let me share my full screen here. That sort of concludes our lecture uh, portion here. We're actually gonna work some examples here with VASP. Let me, uh, let me share my full screen one second.
Can you guys see my slide here? Yep. Okay, good. All right, so we're gonna go to, okay, so let's put this example here. And we're gonna work, okay, so the first example, let me make this a little bigger. Okay, so the first example here is, um, all right, so we're gonna run an aluminum calculation. And what we're gonna do, um, we're gonna run the first example together to show you. Um, so we're gonna model aluminum using VAST. Uh, what we're gonna do together is we're gonna create the postcard, which is the geometry file. So we're gonna create where the atoms sit and we're gonna, we're gonna create that file, that file formatted for VASP. And then we're gonna create the K points file, which is the, the, how we're gonna inform VASP how to create that grid that I talked about. And then we're gonna run VASP. So the hints here, the, 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 the information you need is that aluminum is an FCC structure. And then I give you the lattice parameter, okay, 4.05. You can get this from our website. You can get it from Wikipedia. So we're gonna go here to our, our um, we're gonna go to our portal. We're gonna right click to, to open up a terminal. Okay, just like we did with Marco earlier this morning and with Cormac, um, we're gonna load module A flow. So module load A flow. So we get VASP and A flow loaded into our environment. I'm gonna make this larger. Just give this. Let me make it larger. Okay, so it should be pretty easy to see. So uh, if you look in your desktop, you hit LS, you should see day one. So we're gonna go inside day one, LS. Uh, you should see, uh, you know, we already completed this session, we completed this session. So we're gonna, we're gonna go to this directory here. So CD 0 0.1, and then I'm just gonna hit tab to auto complete. Okay, LS. And then we're going to go inside of exercises. We're going to go inside of energy. Um, and we're going to go inside of aluminum. Okay. And then we're going to go inside of this first directory standard conventional. Okay. So inside of this directory is where we're going to run VASP. Um, VASP requires four input files. Okay, so it requires what's called the in-car, which is uh, the input settings for the run. Okay, so whether we have spin on, what we set our, our energy cutoff for, for the basis set, all these things are gonna sit inside the in-car. I'm gonna show you the in-car in a second. We have our pot car, which is our pseudo potential file. Okay, and so in this case, it's gonna have the pseudo potential of aluminum. And then we need two additional files, which we're gonna to create together. We need our postcard, which is our geometry file, where the atoms sit and what the crystal looks like. Um, and then we need our K points file for how we create our grid. Using those four files, we can actually run VASP. Okay, so we're gonna look inside of the in-car and we're gonna do that by doing, by typing view in-car, okay? Um, we're gonna to try to make this a little bigger. All right, so let's look at some of the settings that are set in here. All right, so this, this continues out for a little bit. One second. All right, so there's a number of settings. All right, it's okay. All right, so we have system. The system is the system name, so we're gonna give it aluminum. This is really just a comment field. You can give it whatever you want here, but just, you know, I give it the name aluminum because that's what we're modeling. Ibrion 2, this Ibrion is the setting that tells VAST that we want to relax our structure. So we're going to give it an input, which is going to be based on what we understand about aluminum experimentally from the literature. And then we're going to ask it to relax the structure to, to the minimum energy configuration. Okay, so it's going to move the ions around to try to find which configuration is the minimum. Um, and NSW is the number of steps that are gonna be taken. So, you know, it's going basically, remember from our self-consistent uh, approach, 
what's basically going to happen is we're going to we're going to run the calculation. It's going to try to figure out what the electron configuration is. Once it converges the electrons, it's going to move the ions. And once it moves the ions, it's going to re reconfigure and try to solve what the electron configuration looks like. So it's going to move the ions 51 times. That should be enough times for it to find a minimum energy configuration. I SIF equals three. This is telling how we're going to relax the structure. So we're going to allow the system to fully relax. And that includes relaxing the forces on all the atoms, relaxing the stress tensor, the positions of the atoms, the cell shape, and the cell volume. VASP has a number of options here. You can actually, for instance, relax the volume without changing the shape. Okay, so if you know where you want to relax just the volume, you can, there's actually a setting for that. L orbital equals 10. This, is just, this just tells VASP to give us the spin decomposition in case the system is magnetic. Number of bands equals 33. This is our input for the number of bands that we want to model for our system. So we know that aluminum has, uh, I think aluminum is 13, um, right? It has 13, uh, yeah, it's 13 electrons. So as long as we give it something more than 13, we're in a safe space. We're going to give it 33. This is just a number that uh, A-flow calculates for that system. Um, I sim equals two. We want VAST to be able to leverage all of the symmetry it can identify in the reciprocal space to reduce the number of K points to the minimum set and then figure out all the weights. So that's what that setting is telling it. L wave equals false. We don't want to write out this big wave car. Remember, the wave car contains all of the coefficients for these plane waves that we're solving. It's, it's going to be a big binary file. We're not going to look at those coefficients. We're really just looking. We're interested in the properties we can get using those coefficients. L charge equals true. We just want to, we want to write out the, the charge car file. Precision equals accurate. Um, we're going to remember, we're working in the reciprocal space. So there's going to be some, we want to, we're actually going to be using some Fourier transforms um, to solve our system. And accurate says that we want to have our, our mesh for the Fourier transform be as dense as possible. En max, um, this is actually that that energy parameter I described earlier, which tells how large that basis set of plane waves should be. Okay, so we're going to include a number of terms uh, up to that energy cutoff. And VASP gives us, I'll show you in a second, but VASP gives us a default for each pseudopotential. In this case, it's 240.3. This is this is uh, an EV, and we multiply that by 1.4 just to make the calculation that much uh, 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 that much more accurate. E diff is actually the convergence criteria for our electronic steps. I'll show you that in the in the example, but we're going to set it to 1.1 times 10 to the minus six. So we want we want the difference between the the solved solution and the solution this rather the solution we plug into the operator and the solution we solve from that eigenvalue problem to be equivalent to within 10 to the 10 to the uh, to the minus 6 and then these last two parameters um, are very important because um, we have we we know that aluminum is a metal and metals don't have a band gap and so when we're solving our orbitals and our energy we're going to have some there's going to be some difficulty because the ones by the band gap, when, when we're, since there's no, well, they're by the Fermi energy, since there's no band gap, there's going to be this, what's called charge sloshing, where it's going to flip between solution of having uh, an electron occupied above the Fermi energy and one occupied below. And so there's going to be this flipping back and forth. And so it's, it's, it's the solution keeps flipping back and forth. In order to avoid this, this purely, uh, um, uh, it's, 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 a, it's an artifact of just the fact of how we're calculating the, 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 the orbitals. To avoid this, we allow some fractional electrons. This is just a hack to get the calculation to converge. There is no such thing as a fractional electron, but by allowing fractional electrons mathematically or, or from a calculational perspective, the, the system will find a minimum faster. Okay, so that's, the, uh, that's what's inside the NCAR. We're going to exit this file by, by hitting colon Q. Okay. We're going to look briefly at the pot car. You can just look at my screen for this. Um, we're going to look at the pot car. All I want you to notice is that this pot car is specific for aluminum. Paw, paw is uh, the projector augmented wave, wave method that I talked about earlier. P 
PBE is the, is the exchange correlation functional I discussed in the previous slide. And then this is for aluminum, okay? Um, and you can see that there should be an EN max. This is the default defined by the vast developers that they say you should not model your system with any fewer plane waves than this, okay? That's all I want you to take a look. There's a number of parameters in there. They're largely, some of them are, are not really known. They're kind of proprietary to VASP but they all, they all work to, to define what that student potential looks like. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and create the other two files. So how do we do this? Um, okay, so we went through the in-car, hot car. Okay, so we're gonna create an FCC conventional structure for, um, for aluminum. We know, what it's, we know what its lattice parameter is. Um, we know it's 4.05. Oh, one second. Let me uh, shrink this down a little bit. Okay, so uh, we're going to create a, a postcard file. Okay, so uh, well, let me let me take, take it out. So you want you're gonna well, you can you can do this with a text editor. Actually, that might be a, a better way of doing it. I'm not going to do this with the eye. Uh, one second. So we're going to open up our 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 our, our space here. Um, we're, go we're actually, no, let me open up applications, accessories. We're going to open G edit. Okay. And I'm going, what are the first thing I'm going to do is actually save this file before I do anything. I'm going to save this file in that directory. So let's go hit save as. Um, we're going to go to our, our desktop. Okay. So we should start at the desktop, go into day one, VASP exercises. Go into energy, just keep following the first one, okay, here. And we're gonna we're gonna call our file the we're gonna call it the postcard. Okay, we're gonna hit save. Okay, I'll give you guys a few seconds to catch up if you need it. And we're gonna write out the postcard file. Okay, so the postcard file. Uh, the first line is just a comment line, just to say what the what the file is. So I'm just going to put aluminum there. The second line is what's called the scaling factor. We're not going to work with the scaling factor much in this session, but we're just going to put one here, and that's going to tell us that we're not going to inflate or deflate the volume of the structure beyond what we're defining it. The next three lines are the lattice vectors. Okay, where each row defines lattice vector one, lattice vector two, lattice vector three. So FCC, I actually give you the coordinates for the lattice vectors. So lattice vector one is the, is the lattice parameter in the X direction. So it's, it's so the first, the first vector is all along the, the X direction. The second parameter, second lattice uh, vector is, is the lattice parameter all in the Y direction. And then the third one is the lattice parameter all in the Z direction, okay? So for the first parameter, it's all in the X direction. There's no Y or Z component. So we're going to put 4.0500. 0, 0. Okay, so it's all in the X, none in the Y, none in the Z. We're going to go to the second lattice parameter. It's all in the Y, none in the X, none in the Z. So we're going to put 0. And just to format this nicely, I'm going to put 4.05 here and then 0. And I'm going to shift my coordinates here like this. Okay, so you can see kind of the matrix. All right, and then you can guess where we're going. It's all in the Z direction, none in the X and none in the Y, none in the Y, zero, and then 4.05, okay? So this is lattice vector, this is lattice vector one, lattice vector two, lattice vector three, okay? Um, now, okay, so there's two pieces to a, a crystal. There's the lattice vectors that defines our box, and then we're gonna fill that box with where the atoms sit. That's called the basis. The basis for a standard conventional representation of aluminum, it's gonna have four atoms in it. So the next number tells us how many atoms we have. We're gonna put four there. We're gonna write the word direct. Okay, so it's gonna say that we're gonna write the, the, the lattice, we're gonna write the atom positions in direct coordinates. And it's gonna become obvious when I specify them. But basically, so the basis for an FCC standard conventional, it's gonna have four atoms. Okay, these are the these are the atoms here. I, I draw I drew them out. Um, so we're gonna have one at the origin, an atom at the origin. That's this guy here. We're gonna have another atom 
halfway through lattice vector one plus halfway through lattice vector two. And remember, it's pretty simple since they're, the, they're defined with respect to X, Y, and Z. So that, that second one is he's going to be halfway through lattice vector one and then halfway through lattice vector two. That's, that's this atom here. And we have another one, which is halfway through lattice vector one and then halfway through lattice vector um, um, uh, uh, lattice, lattice vector three. Okay, so that's going to be, uh, I think it's this guy here. Sorry, no, it's, it's actually this guy here sitting here, um, which is equivalent to one of the ones I've circled here. And then we have another atom, which is halfway through lattice vector two and halfway through lattice vector three. Okay, so you can, so you can see that with using these four atoms, I basically recreate this standard conventional FCC structure here. Okay, the other atoms um, be, are un or they, they're, they're equivalent to those atoms. And so when we unfold the structure, you can see that. So for instance, the corner here is equivalent to all these other corners here. Okay, so they're just, corn they're just the origin for the other crystals, which are, you know, the next crystal is gonna start up here and that's gonna be that origin. The other, another crystal is going to start, another uh, unit cell is going to start here. That's going to be that origin there. So these, all these corners here are equivalently this, this atom here. Okay, so let's actually write out those coordinates. So the first one sits at the origin. The origin you can guess is zero, zero, zero. Okay. The next one sits at halfway from lattice vector one and halfway from lattice vector two. So we're going to write 0 0.5 put another space here just for, for, uh, for formatting 0 0.5 and zero. So now you can see what direct coordinates means. It's a little frozen for a second. Um, so you can see now what direct coordinates mean. It means that we're gonna write out the coefficient if we write the coordinates with respect to the lattice vectors. So you can imagine that, you know, this lattice vector, this is really one half times 4.05 in the x direction, right? So I could have written this in sort of a Cartesian sense where I could have written 4.05 um, in x. But instead, we're gonna write it out in this simplified for format of direct coordinates where it's just the coefficients of writing it with respect to the last vectors, okay? So you can see this is gonna be pretty simple. The next one is 0 0.5 in the first position. We have, we have zero in the second position and then 0 0.5 in the third. And then we're gonna have, we're gonna have you know, A2, A3. So that's zero for the first coordinate, 0 0.5 here and 0 0.5 here. Any questions about how this file is created? I'm gonna chat up one second. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, I didn't make, the, I didn't make it larger. Let me do that. Um, I should be able to make it larger. Plus, no. How do I increase the size? I'm actually not sure. Oh, here. Should be able to. No, it's just searching for text. No, I don't. I don't know actually how to make it bigger. No, it doesn't look like the editor offers that option. But you should be able to follow along with the slides. Um, so if you open up the PowerPoint, you can see that. Um, if you go to the next slide, I actually write it out here for you. Okay. No worries. Okay, so we're gonna hit save, uh, and we're gonna close this file out. Okay. And we're going to open up a new file. When it opens it up, it should actually be in the same directory we were earlier. Um, oh, not open. I'm sorry. We're going to create a new one. And we're going to save it immediately. And we're going to call it K points. Right. Um, we're going to open up. And we're, we should be in the same directory as the postcard we just created. I'm going to call it K points. And I'm going to hit save. Okay, so, um, all right, so the K points file. Uh, let's, so the first line, just like the postcard is a comment line, K points. Um, and we're going to, okay, the next line specifies 
the um, the fact that we want Vast to create the grid for us. So it's going to be mode zero, whereas mode one would be, for instance, uh, um, or you can put in a number, another setting there, and that would tell it that you want to specify your own K points and K grid. Um, okay, so zero. The next line is going to be what type, whether we want to make Moncourse pack or gamma. So gamma, we're going to write here. Oh, great. Fonts and color. One second. Edit. References. It looks like I can't do this. Fonts and color. Change font size. Just click the box use. Yeah. Yep. Oh, perfect. All right. Let's make it huge. Awesome. Is that much better? Yep. Thanks, David. All right. So mm -hmm. eight points, zero, gamma. Uh, 10, 10, or 10. Okay, so what we're writing here is that we want to specify how large the grid's going to be in every direction. So along uh, the reciprocal last vector, we want a grid of 10. Along uh, the first grid, uh, along the first reciprocal last vector, we want a grid of 10. Along the second one, we want a grid of 10. And along the third, we want a grid of 10. Okay. And then the last line, we're not going to worry too much about the shifting, but shifting is allowed. So you can actually shift your, 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 your grid um with respect to uh the origin or however however you define it whether it's Moncourse pack or gamma center so we're just going to write zero 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 so there's no shift okay so this is how we write out our k points file we're going to hit save and close it out okay i'm actually going to leave this this editor open here i'm going to go back to my terminal if you hit ls you should see that there are now, well, we have, we have uh, these files open here. This is okay, we can leave that there. But we have our K points file and our postcard file, okay? So now we have our four files. We should be able to run VASP, okay? So to run VASP, you're gonna write VASP standard and then hit enter. And if it started, it means that we created the files correctly if you get to this point, okay? All right, so what are, we, what are we seeing here? We're actually seeing this, this uh, iterative scheme happen in real time. So each of these lines, we, what we have is we have, we have sort of an ion, we, the ions are fixed in a particular position and we're trying to converge the electron. What are the electrons look like? Where are they sitting in space? What are the wave functions? So each of this step, this is, this is uh, each of these steps will tell us um, um, what the energy looks. Okay, so this first step, this is the, you know, the step number one here we have uh energy the energy of the system the free energy of the system we have the change of the free energy with respect to the last step that's delta e then we have our change in energy with respect so the change in the band structure energy um and then we're not going to worry about these other parameters here but this basically has to do with this is an rmsv value this, uh, this is the number of times that the operator has been applied to the wave function but you can see here that each step tells us the change in the energy. And you can see that, I'm gonna scroll up here so you can see. But basically the, the change in the energy should be going down because we, you know, we're, we're iterating through the steps and the difference between the, 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 the solution we plugged into the operator and the one we get from the eigenvalue, eigen, eigenvalue problem should start to converge. And once it gets below one e to the minus six, the electron configuration is converged. So now you see here that we had we have step one here, so we have we have we we've converged the, the electrons at a particular configuration. Then we're going to shift our ions a little bit, and we're going to converge the electrons again. So that's what you see here. We solve that the electrons at that step, and then we move it again. And if the energies don't change very much, there's actually another parameter that's defined implicitly, which is what the cutoff is for the ions after for, for how, how much we change and shift the ions. We only needed to move the ions three steps to converge uh, the system. Okay, and so you can see here that after a certain point, we, we get this message saying re reached required accuracy, stopping structural energy minimization. Okay, once we get that, the calculation is done. So I'm going to hit LS and you're going to see that we have a bunch more files written here, a lot more files. Um, there's a few that I want to point out. Let's see. 
Yeah, the first one's gonna be called the Kant card. All right, so you don't have to do this on your screen, just follow along with mine. I'm going to cat the postcard. Just as a reminder, remember, this is the input configuration I gave it. I said, this is what we know from experiment. I'm gonna tell you where the atoms are sitting. So they, they're sitting you know, uh, um, in, in this particular configuration and the lattice parameter is 4.05, okay? Now, if I wanna know how the ions have changed since running this relaxation, I'm going to cat the Kant car, okay? The Kant car is the final positions file. Um, here we have, I ignore these numbers at the bottom. They're basically, they're sort of important if we run a, a molecular dynamics run, but these are kind of the, the velocities after, the, real, after the, the, the MD run. But really this, this top piece here is just the postcard file format. And what I want you to notice are two things. The direct coordinates actually did not change from the input we provided earlier. Okay, so we have more precision here, but they actually did not move. In the direct in, in the direct coordinate space sense. However, the lattice parameter, which was 4.05, that changed. So this is a benefit of writing things in direct coordinates because you can see that you can actually see how the lattice changed. The atoms moved inside of the cell, but they all moved relative to each other. And so really what moved, what changed was the lattice parameter. And we can see that by because of the fact that we wrote it in direct coordinates. If we had written this in Cartesian coordinates, then what we would see is that the atoms shift, but we wouldn't really understand how they shift. It's very clear here that what changed was that the lattice shrunk, okay? So instead of 4.05, we're seeing that the lattice parameter is now 4.04 .04 and change, okay? Um, okay, so this is one file I wanted you to view. The next file I want you to view is called the outcar. The outcar is the giant output file from VASP just contains really all the information of the run. It's very large. So as you scroll down, scroll down with your arrow key, you can move just up and down with your arrow key. Um, but you'll see that, you know, basically gives you some feedback. Okay, you have certain pseudo potentials. Um, and you're going to get information about the input structure that it understood. And then it's going to run, it's going to figure out the irreducible K points. There's a lot in this file. I want you to really, the important piece is at the bottom. So I want you to, to, without doing anything else, just hit shift G and that's going to take you to the bottom of the file. Okay. So this, there's no more to the bottom of the file here. The last piece of the file gives you some general timings and information for the job. You can see here that the, the amount of time it took to calculate the system, um, different parameters, how much, how much time it took from a processor perspective, what it looked like for you, um, the amount of memory used. Um, those are really the important pieces there. I want you to scroll up. You can see the charge breakup based on, uh, or, or, or on, on e for each ion, you can see how much charge is associated with S, how much is associated with orbital B, how much is associated with orbital D, et cetera. Um, then I want you to keep moving up the most important piece of this file is this line here, the energy without entropy. This is the energy we calculate for the system. Okay, so for the, given the four atoms that we have, this is the total energy of the system. Okay, and then there's a bunch of other pieces in this, in this file. I'll point out, you don't have to do this on your screen, but I'll just point out that you get the, the forces on the atoms and you can see that they're all zero. You know, this is a long X, long Y, long Z. All of the forces along the atoms are zero. That means that we're really at a minimum, okay? And that's, that's what you wanna see. So if you give it the wrong parameters, maybe you don't give it enough uh, K points, you don't give it enough of an FFT grid, you might see some forces on the atoms at the end, okay? So now we're gonna quit. We're gonna hit colon Q, all right? And so I think that's all I wanted to cover for this piece of it. Um, we're going to... Um, Okay, so the next one is an exercise that we're gonna do, to, we're gonna do uh, in our respective breakup rooms. Let me explain um, the scenario. Well, first, actually, let me take you to that directory. And you know, if you have some trouble now, um, the, you can ask the person who's helping, you're leading your session uh, a little later, but I'm gonna go out from this directory. So I'm gonna hit up and then I'm going to go into, uh, I'm gonna put slash and I'm gonna go into this, the standard primitive representation. Okay, I'm going to hit enter. 
I give the command here in the slide here if you just want to copy paste. All right, I'm going to do ls. Um, and you're going to see a bunch of directories. Uh, k points one, two, three, four, five. You're going to go inside of k. You're going to start with go inside of k points 10 by 10 by 10. Okay. And if you do an ls, you're going to see that I give you the in car, k points, and pot car file. Okay. So um, we already looked at the in car and the pot car. The k points is actually the same file that we wrote out earlier. We want a 10 by 10 grid, 10 by 10 by 10. What you're going to do for this exercise is you're going to first create the postcard for the primitive representation of aluminum in an FCC configuration. Okay, so I give you some hints here in the slide. You know, we have 4.05, that's the lattice parameter. I give you the lattice vectors. Okay. Um, so you should be able to create the postcard just as I did earlier, given these, this information. The other piece of information to know is that the basis is zero. Oh, sorry, the basis is one and it's just at the origin. So if you have a, if you have a, a primitive, uh, standard primitive representation, it always has one atom and it's gonna be at the origin, okay? You can just put it at the origin. So, um, okay, so I think, the next slide. yeah, okay. So we're gonna go into our breakout rooms and what, okay, so let me explain. So you're gonna do, you're gonna run the, you're gonna create the postcard, run the 10 by 10 by 10 uh, K points run, um, and then I want you to look at the energy you get and the lattice parameters you get for that run. And then with your, with whoever's leading the group, you're going to run, you're going to, you know, I think what you want to do is you're going to want to have one person run the one by one by one, one person do the one, the two by two by two. So break it up so that everybody's running this in parallel. And then once everyone's finished with their run, we're going to go, we're going to, we'll discuss in the breakout room. We're gonna we're gonna take what the energy values are and the lattice parameters, and you're gonna see how they change as we vary the k points. Okay, what you might expect is that as we increase the k points, we make the grid more dense. Um, the the energy is going to converge at a certain point, and so are the lattice parameters. So you might see some fluctuations with early k points because we don't have enough calculate we don't have enough of a of a um, accuracy. But as we increase the accuracy of the calculation, you should see that these parameters are going to converge. And beyond that, you, if you look at the times, which we'll go over together when we come back, times will also increase because we're increasing the accuracy of the calculation. So let's go ahead and break up. I think uh, I'll stop sharing here. I think some people came back, so we're going to have to reassign them to breakout rooms. Um, let's, let, me do, let me do that. I might need some help doing that too. So I'll assign you the room two. Actually, if everyone, if all of the 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 the, the, sm the small group leads want to grab people from their from their respect who were in their in their group earlier, that would be better. I can I can just start assigning that way we don't have the chaos. Thank you, Marco. All right, I'll go to room two. Uh, Marco, can you put me in room three as well? I think I, I don't know if I'm assigned there at the moment. You are in room three. Okay. Okay, looks like we're getting everybody back. Uh, I just want to quickly show some results, and then we're going to break for lunch. Um, and when, when we're bro when we're broken up for lunch, you know, you guys are free, free to stay, ask questions if you have any other lingering questions. But let me just share my screen, and uh, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna, I just want to wrap up a few results. Um, Okay, so um, I hope everybody was able to make the primitive representation. Um, should have been pretty easy, just creating the last vectors and then putting the atom at the origin. Um, 
I just want to point out a few things that um, in, in, in case it didn't come up, but the, the standard primitive representation cut the calculation time in half with respect to the conventional one. So remember that the conventional cell had four atoms in it. And by reducing our representation of aluminum, the, it's still FCC, it's the same structure. We just, we took a different cut of it from the full periodic system. We took a smaller cut of it that's, that is a different uh, 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 repeating unit, but it's smaller. By doing that, by finding the, the primitive representation, we're able to cut the calculation time in, in, in half. And so finding the reduced representation is very important to reducing the calculation time. Um, results are going to vary, but, but these are the, uh, um, I, I did this, this, this set of calculations on a particular computer, and I just want to show how the results scale with the number of K points. Um, the idea here is that if you look at the energy versus the number of K points, um, you can you can get very different answers for very few k points. You know, remember the idea is that if you have one or two k points, you're really you're really you have a very high weighting for those one or two points in space that's supposed to represent the rest of the Brillouin zone. So depending on which point you pick, if you pick one that's very close to a high symmetry point, you might get a, a, maybe you get a, a very high you get a, a very different energy than if you pick something further away. So results will vary. Um, and so you wanna to get to get higher convergence, you wanna have a good sampling of the K space. And so you're gonna see that it plateaus here. Number of K points versus the, the lattice parameter, which is a property we get of the, of the, of the structure. Um, it looks like it varies a lot, it actually doesn't. The numbers don't flip once, once you get to about 10, really the numbers don't change very much. Um, and then time with the number of K points is going to just keep increasing. So you're getting more and more accurate results. And of course that comes at a cost of a, of a higher calculation. Um, with that, I, I'm gonna officially conclude the, the session. You guys are gonna break, we're gonna break for lunch. We'll meet back here at 2 p.m. Central, uh, Central time. Um, and, uh, and, and you guys are free to go get lunch and come back at 2 p.m. We'll pick up with the next set of exercises. Um, and I'll, I'll stick around for anyone who has any questions or, or, or has any uh, issues with their calculation. All right, I'll see you guys at 2 p.m. Okay, so <clears throat> let me share my screen. We're gonna pick up uh, with uh, the next set. We're actually gonna pick up immediately with the next exercise. Um, <clears throat> we wrapped up last, uh, um, we wrapped up about uh, what is it, half an hour ago, um, we finished up the calculation for aluminum in the standard primitive representation, and we looked at how the properties <clears throat> scale with uh, the number of K points. So for this exercise, um, we're going to go to our small groups. Um, let's see. So if you left your terminal open, you should be in the standard primitive um, directory. You're going to go up to... Uh, to iron, the iron example. And then you're going to, well, <clears throat> we're going to run both examples in our groups. So here are the instructions for, um, for the groups. So in the small groups, we're going to create the postcards for various lattices of iron. So um, we'll, have, we'll have directories for a BCC lattice an FCC lattice, and then two for hexagonal, one with a smaller C over A ratio and one with a larger one, <clears throat> one greater than, uh, one, one smaller than 0 0.1 or one smaller than one and one greater than one. Um, okay, so uh, within the small groups, we're gonna run one, variants of those lattices, uh, including spin and then one without spin. Of course, we know that iron is magnetized. So we're going to see how the results change when we turn off spin versus when we turn it on in the calculation. Um, <clears throat> some notes about creating the lattices. So um, I give you the experimental lattice parameter here, 2.87. Uh, for BCC, use the experimental uh, lattice parameter that I give you, but for all other lattices, use the experimental lattice parameter times 10% or in, in, adding 10% to it. So what is that? 2.87 times 1.1. 1 
you should use a lattice for all the other lattices, use a lattice parameter of 3.157. Um, otherwise you may run into a, a weird, um, you, your calculation may not converge. So try to try increasing the volume a, a bit. Um, so hex one, M is C over A equals 0.9, and hex 1P is C over A 1.1. Um, the, param the, the, the lattice parameters are specified here. Remember that the standard re primitive representation, these are all standard primitive representations, only has one atom at the origin. So <clears throat> compare the energies among the lattices for both spin on and spin off and see which one is lower. You expect that the lower energy configuration is the one that we should we should see in experiment, um, and then compare the lattice parameters. You relax in the original. Um, I'll just show you the input files here on the slides. Okay, so <clears throat> you'll see that in the in-car, which I give you, um, there's some the, the param a bit of the parameters have changed. So N bands is increased, of course, because iron has more electrons and has 26. So we increase it to 45, just something larger than 26. En max is larger um, because En max for the iron pseudopotential is, is bigger. And so we, we, we give it a, a cushion there, 1.4. So we get a larger En max. Um, when we turn spin on, by default, spin is off for the calculations. When we turn spin on, you're going to see a number of parameters that have been included. Um, so I spin equals two. That tells VASP that uh, that it's a spin magnetized, <clears throat> calcul spin polarized calculation. I spin one is is non non spin polarized. And when you turn it on, you're going to want to give it an, an an initial magnetic moment for the the ions for the number of ions. So there's going to be one ion in each of these. There's only one atom in the in the in the unit cell. So we're just going to give it <clears throat> a default of uh, magnetization of one um, as an input parameter here. Okay, and I think that's all we want to do. Yeah, if I, it, in your in your groups, you're going to want to create a table like this for no spin and spin, um, where you show uh, what what the energy is for each of the the different lattices. You can you can do the lattice parameters as well, um, and you can record the time and try to see. Which one's the minimum energy structure for no spin and spin? You can do that together in the in the groups. So let's go. Let's go to our our. Um, I'll stop sharing. Let's go into our breakout rooms. Let me go ahead and reassign. No problem. Thank you, Marco. Yes, Corey, I need to reassign you to your breakout rooms. So. Yeah, it's true. Thanks. Oh, we're still, perfect. We're still waiting on on the one room. I will. How come they're not coming back? All right, give them give them another minute, and if not, we'll we'll start up.
All right, it looks like people are starting to come back. So, um, all right, I got a few, I think we got a few questions that are useful. Um, first and foremost, someone asked uh, um, appropriately, what is iSpinD versus iSpin? iSpinD is, is I, I believe it was an old parameter used by VASP, but it might've been an older VASP versions where um, there was a difference between I, between turning on the spin, the, the option for spin polarize and actually indicating that spin polarize is, is, is what you want. So um, it's no longer necessary. You can just rely on I spin. Um, uh, so I, I spin these there because um, it's, it, these, these input files were created automatically with A-flow. And so that parameter is there to accommodate for the various VAST versions. Um, I recognize some of you didn't get to the full story of, of, of um, the, uh, the, the, what's going on here with iron, but I'm just gonna show you really quickly what, what the idea was behind this, 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 uh, this calculation. For no spin, okay, well, first, and, first of all, we know that iron from experiments is a BCC, has a BCC lattice. If you have a no spin calculation, what you see is that the minimum energy uh, structure is FCC, okay, incorrectly, all right? And then uh, if we turn spin on, we'll see that BCC uh, ends up becoming the lower spin structure. So without spin in a world where, where, where there's no spin, uh, iron would be FCC. And, and in this world where we have spin, you know, iron is, is BCC. So that's the idea there. Um, but really the goal is to, is to see that you were able to create the structures with these different lattice parameters, uh, different lattice uh, uh, um, configurations and, uh, and be able to create the structure and see that. So, but this is, this is just a nice little story too to pick up on, on that idea. All right, so uh, we're gonna do another set of exercises. Uh, I'm gonna run through, let me see how much time I wanna spend on this. Okay, example two, I wanna spend about 10 minutes on this. Okay, so we've done energy calculations. I'll put on my, no, actually I'm gonna leave it like this for now. Um, Everybody can read, right? It's not too hard to read. I'll make it a little bigger. Um, all right, so we're, what we're gonna do now, okay, so we've done energy uh, calculations. We've, we've taken the structure, we've relaxed it, we've relaxed the coordinates and gotten the energy. What we're gonna do now is calculate the density of states and the band structure, okay? So for this exercise, I'm gonna run an example for you. We're gonna do the first one, we're gonna do silicon. Um, but you're going to do, I've given eight examples and we're going to spend our time in this, in the small groups running through as many examples as you can get through. So for all the systems where I've given you all the files, so all you have to do is just run VASP. I've given you the in car, pot car, post car, and the K points file. You just have to run VASP for the DOS calculation. Um, and then you're going to plot the DOS using a flow. Okay, so this is, this is one case where we're gonna use AFLO to plot the density of states so you can see what it looks like. Um, you're gonna copy the charge car file into the bands calculation. I give you the command here because you're gonna have uh, a density of states directory and then one for the bands calculation. So you're gonna copy the charge car into the bands calculation. Um, this is the big exercise. You're gonna create a K points file consistent with the symmetry of the Bravais lattice. This is where you're gonna spend the majority of your time in the small groups is creating this K points file. Once you create it, run the bands calculation. So you're gonna run VASP. Then you're going to link the out car from the density of states into your bands calculation. Okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna basically, you can copy or link either one, but basically you want the out car from the density of states calculation in your current directory of the bands calculation. Um, and then you're gonna link your bands out car to out car bands or copy it. You just wanna, basically you want the out car from your current directory to be called out car bands. You're gonna run a flow minus minus band gap. It's gonna calculate the band gap for you. And then you can plot it using a flow plot bands dot put band dos. Okay, so this command here. Um, you're gonna wanna get the, uh, so you, you're gonna wanna see the, um, okay, you're gonna wanna open this publication. So you can click on this link and it's gonna open up uh, the publication for you. 
Um, and then you're gonna want you're gonna want to know that the that alpha is the angle between B and C, beta is the angle between A and C, and gamma is the angle between A and B. Okay, that's important for creating the the K point the K points file. Let's create it together. All right, so I'm gonna move this over here. Give me a second so I can get all my windows correct. Oh, one second. Okay, so I lost the window. One second. All right, so for everybody, let's go to, you should be inside of the iron set of directories. We're gonna come back out um, and even out of the energy. So keep doing CD dot dot. And we wanna go into two density of states band structure, okay? And, and for our example here, we're gonna go inside of uh, silicon, one silicon, all right? You should see two directories in there, one for the density of states and one for the bands. And we're gonna go inside of the density of states, okay? Um, I'm just gonna show you, uh, well, we the, the postcard here, this is just the structure for silicon. Silicon is FCC, um, but there's two silicon atoms. So the basis has two atoms in it, okay? But you can see that Silicon has that, that structure that we've been playing around with for FCC where you have Y, Z, you have X, Z, and then X, Y. Um, and then you have a basis of two. Um, the uh, the K points file is gonna be a little, well, it's gonna be 10 by 10 by 10. That's all we need for that. And then the NCAR file, um, I'm gonna point out what is really different here. Um, we're gonna be running I smear equals minus five. So this is the tetrahedron method. The tetrahedron method, let me open this up a little bit. The tetrahedron, oh, let me cut it again. Okay, the tetrahedron method, which is the setting for I smear equals minus five. This is uh, the tetrahedron method with, with, with black hole corrections. Um, this, is, this is really the most accurate setting for uh, the density of states. We have, we have a sigma here because um, we, we don't want the, the, we want to make Sigma as small as possible. We want to have a Sigma for this setting. Um, but it's going to be small so that the, the, there isn't too much, um, uh, um, the fraction, we don't have a big, uh, a fractional coordinate, uh, allowance, let's say. Um, since we're running a static calculation, we're not going to allow the, the ions to move. So we're going to set the, the no ionic steps to zero. Um, we set Ibrion equals to two. So we, it's the same setting for the relaxation of the energy of the, um, the energy calculations, but the ions are not going to move. So we're just going to have one, one, one electronic, one ionic step where we, we just converge the electrons. Uh, NLM is the number of, of allowed electronic self-consistent steps. Uh, let's see what else is really important here. And then we want to set the, the energy values for the density of states. We're going to explore energy values between minus 30 and 45, and we're going to have 5,000 steps between those two energy values. So when we calculate the density of states, uh, we want to run from the, those two energy ranges and have a very, and have a very, uh, um, a dense sampling between those energies. Okay, so we're going to run VASP. So we're going to just run VASP standard and we're going to hit run. Go ahead and let that go. Does anyone have any questions so far? It should just be running for everybody. Okay, it finished. 
um, <clears throat> so you'll see that there are no ionic steps here. It's ju it just converged the density of states, okay? And we can actually plot it with A flow minus minus plot DOS. Give it a second. And I'm actually gonna open up uh, my directory here so that we can go inside and take a look. Inside of class, exercises, density of states. Okay. And so I can open up the file here and you're gonna see that AFLOW plotted the density of states for us. Okay, so these are, this is uh, the number of, of uh, this is a count of the number of, of electronic states that exist at any given delta, delta energy value, okay? So um, you can see here that we have, we have a band gap, okay? So this is, this is some sort of semiconductor insulator. That's what we expect for silicon. Um, okay, so we're going to want to copy our charge car into the bands calculation. Okay, we're going to go into the bands calculation. Um, I'm going, the K point, okay, hold on. The post car is the same. Okay, the pod car is the same. The in car is a little different. Um, I will point out what is the difference here. I smear is going to be zero. This is just Gaussian smearing um, and a very small sigma. Uh, not, nothing to worry about there. We're not going to be doing any uh, relaxation here. The ions are not going to move. Um, but we have an I charge setting here of 11, which means that we're not going to, VASP generally initiates the charge density um, as it, it initiates as a guess what the charge density should be. Here we're telling it don't don't guess the charge density nor change it. Read in the charge density from the static calculation and use that as the basis for this new upcoming calculation. Um, because the the static calculation was done um, at a the 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 charge car was converged very well for that that density of states calculation. Okay, so now the goal is we want to create the K points file. Okay. So uh, if you want to follow along with, uh, okay, so let me, let me get my, yeah, this is going to be the tricky bit. All right. So let's see. All right. So we want to, the idea here is that we want to create a band structure plot. Okay. Um, I'll show you what the picture looks like. So we know what we're getting. This is the density of states. This is the picture we just looked at, right? So we have, we have some sort of uh, a band gap. Right, this is what we just saw. This is the full picture of the electronic states. Um, as as we basically what we're doing is here's the Brion zone for silicon, and what we're doing is we're going to traverse the reciprocal space, solving for the energies and the eigen states uh, along a along a path. Okay, so we're gonna you know we take we look at a particular point. And we solve for the energies and the eigenstates at each individual point. So if we're at gamma, we're going to solve for the, 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 en the allowed energies at gamma. Then we take a step toward X. So X is down here. So we take a step toward X and we solve for the energy values there. So we do this grid until we hit X. Then we go to, from X to W. So we're basically taking a path in the Bruin zone, sampling the allowed states. Um, and this picture tells us, you know, once we get the full picture, um, what are the allowed states as we traverse the, 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 the Brion zone? And then, of course, the, the, the question here is, do we have a band gap, okay, between the Fermi energy and, and, the, and the next, the conducting states? So here we know silicon is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, an insulator, is a semiconductor, and so we're going to expect that there's going to be a band gap. So we need to figure out what is this path to traverse? Okay, what is, and it's, the, the path depends on the symmetry of the structure. So we have an FCC structure and that path has been defined uh, um, as an A-flow A standard. This, is, this, is a, this path is the, is the most symmetric, the smallest path we wanna look at to sample basically the whole Brion zone, okay? Um, okay, so the path here is specified gamma X, W, K, gamma L, U, W, L, K, and then there's a break and then U, X, okay? So we're going to write out that file. Um, and let me see, I think I just need the header information, line mode and reciprocal, one second, let me just. Okay, 
Well, let me do this. I'm not going to do this in VI. I'm going to actually open it up. Close this. Oh, no, this is GED. One second. No, it's not. Give me one second. I'm going to open up. Uh, okay, the file system here. I'm going to come out. I'm going to go into bands. And then I'm going to open up the K points file with, uh, oh, one second. I'm going to open it up with, G so I right click. And I'm going to open it up with, uh, oh, I can't let's see. G edit. That's what I want. Open. Okay. So uh, I just need the header information. So for the K points file, just as we know from before, the, uh, oh, let me make this a little bigger. So the top line is, is the comment line. We're just specifying the K points, the, the K points file for an FCC lattice. Remember this number was zero before for an automatic scheme. And now we're gonna write an, an actual number 20, which means that between each point in the path, between uh, gamma to X, we're gonna sample 20 points along that path, okay? Um, there's a few settings from the header. So we're gonna, we're gonna put line mode OK, so basically we're specifying that we're going to traverse a path uh, between two K points that I'm going to specify in a second. Then I'm going to put reciprocal. This is this is equivalent to that direct line in the postcard, except that um, the coordinates are going to be specified with respect to the reciprocal lattice vectors. OK, and it'll become obvious as I as we as we look at the, the file. So line. OK, that's all I need. OK, so how do we create this file? Let me see if I can get this in the middle. Okay. All right. So this is this is the tricky bit. So now we want to we want to actually create this path in this K points file. So the first thing we want to do is we want to go from gamma to X. So the next line specifies what are the coordinates of gamma. We know that gamma gamma is always the same in every uh, in every lattice, every reciprocal lattice, and it's the origin. So it's zero zero zero. So we're going to specify zero zero zero. And just for my own sanity, I'm going to put that this is gamma. One second. Okay. So I'm going to put the two endpoints of the path. So we're going from gamma to X. So we're going to do 0 0.5. Okay, so uh, X is, you can see here, so it's 1 half, 0, 1 half. And I'm going to put X, okay? I'm going to try to format this a little better, okay? So then I'm going to leave a space. And then, uh, so we know that we're going to traverse 20 grid points between gamma and X. And then we're going to go from X. So I'm going to, oh, I'm going to try to copy that line. Let's see if I can copy. And then paste. And we're going to go from X to W. So now W here is one half. 0 0.25 and then 0 0.75. If you see that I make a mistake, let me know. And that is W. Okay. And then we're going to go from W. Oops, copy. Feel free to, to let me know if you have any questions. I think this should be pretty clear what I'm doing. But we go from W now to K. Okay, K is three over eight, so that is 0 0.375. Okay, 3.75, 3.75, and then 0 0.25, and that is K. And then we go from K Nope, copied the wrong line. We go from K K to um, let's see K to L so L is 0 0.5 0 0.5 0 0.5 simple that's a nice one um, and then we go from L oh, I keep doing that Corey I think K should be 0 0.75 the last coordinate? 
Uh, you're right. Three eight three eight and point seven five. Right. You're right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Then we go from L. Sorry, one second. I lost myself. Or you need to fix another K too. Oh yeah, you're right. Thank you. Uh, right here. Okay, one second. Let me catch up. Gamma, gamma to X, X to W, W to K. K, it's K to gamma, actually. Sorry. I lost myself. See, it's easy to it's easy to get lost. So we go back to gamma, which is zero, zero, zero. Gamma. Okay, and then gamma to L. Gamma to L, okay, and then L to U, U is 5 over 8, which is 0 0.625, 0 0.25, 0 0.625, that's U, copy, paste, so that's U, U to W. We had W up here. So I'm going to copy that line here. Paste. Uh, U to W, W to L. We have L here. And then L to K, we have K elsewhere too. Right, yeah, here. Paste. Okay, now you'll see that there's a break. So instead of copying K, I'm actually just gonna go straight to you. So you. And then X, and X goes up here somewhere. Copy. Okay. And I'm gonna compare with what I have in my notes just to make sure that uh, I'm not doing anything crazy here. Okay, so gamma, gamma to X, that looks right. X to W, W to K, yep. K to gamma, gamma to L, L U, yep, okay. U to W, yep, W to L, L K, and then U X, okay. Yes, it's very tedious. That's kind of the point too. All right, so that's, we'll save that. All right, so we're gonna go back to our terminal. I just wanna make sure that I saved it correctly. Yep, it's all there. And now that we have all of our files here, I'm gonna run VAST standard. Okay. Any questions? I don't know how the chat open. Everybody able to get the the file written? I mean, you can just copy it from the, good. Okay, great. You can just copy it from the PowerPoint and then go here. Remember that it's a little tedious to work with paste. You can paste it in there and then paste it into the file. And it'll take another minute. Yes, that's true. Are there any special characters here? I don't think so. But yes, look out for any special characters. OK. 
Okay. It should be converging pretty soon. You'll see that the energy is dropping off very quickly. So that's a good sign. Meanwhile, I'm going to, all right, we're already here. All right, we should be almost done. That's about our, our convergence criteria. Okay. All right, so uh, in, as per the setting, as per the, the instructions, you need to you need to do some linking. All right, so linking or copying, whichever you want to do. Um, what I'm going to do. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is link the outcar from the stat from the DOS calculation. Outcar here as outcar dot static, and then I'm going to link this current outcar to outcar bands. Okay, so if I do ls, I see the two out cars here. I'm going to run a flow minus minus band gap. Okay, so we get a band gap of about 0.6. Uh, if anyone's interested, try to look up what the band gap of silicon should be. And I would like to hear whether we get lower or higher. What is, does DFT underestimate or overestimate the band gap? Um, and while we're doing that, I'm going to show you how to plot it. Plot DOS band. Oh, um, I have the right command. Oh, band DOS, sorry. Okay. And then if I look inside of my files here, I'm going to see that AFLOW does indeed plot the band, the, the band structure and the density of states. Did anyone find if... Uh, if we underestimate or overestimate the band gap? Anyone know the band, the band gap of silicon? Corey, there's a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't get the linking part. Uh, you didn't get it, but you, you, you did you do it? Did, do you not understand what you're doing or did you not? Um, go ahead and, un, and, un, and un, unmute. I, I, I've not tried it before. You don't get what you uh, did there. Ah, okay. What I did, well, okay. You can run the command. You can just copy paste. Oh, perfect. That's great. Okay. So what am I doing here? I'm basically copying the file. Okay, I'm copying the, the static outcar into this directory, and then I'm renaming the outcar of the bands to outcar bands. That's all I'm doing. And I'm linking it so that basically I don't have to make a, a, bit, a full copy of this file. Um, why do I need to do this? Because AFLOW needs both the information from the static run and the bands run in order to plot the, the, the band structure. Because... We pull the Fermi energy from the static calculation and we pull the K points, uh, the energy values and the K points from the bands calculation. So the density of states calculation is very well converged and we really rely on the Fermi energy as calculated by the static calculation. The reason being, when we do our, um, our analysis of the density of states, um, we're really sampling from the full Brillouin zone. Okay, we make a, a, a um, our K grid is 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 our is is sampled over the whole Brillouin zone. The bands calculation, however, only runs along this path. So we're not real in this calculation in this in this density functional theory calculation. We're not sampling the full Brillouin zone, which means that the Fermi energy is not going to be that reliable. Okay, not as reliable as the static one. That's why we need the information of both the outcar and the, from both the static and the bands calculation. Um, I'm gonna go in order. Uh, Brent, thank you very much for pulling up the band gap of silicon. It is 1.12, which means that since we get 0.6, that DFT underestimates the, <clears throat> underestimates the band gap, which is exactly what we expect. In general, you should expect that the density functional theory is gonna underestimate the band gap. Um, 
Okay, EGAP, that's a good question. EGAP versus EGAP fit. So EGAP is the value we really in, we're really interested in. EGAP fit is a parameter. It's a parameter specific to A-flow. We, we did a fitting to try to correct. There was, there's, a, there's a trend, a, a formula that we had for trying to correct for this underestimation of the band gap from DFT. And so this, this value, it, it might be reliable, it might not be. So I would say for, the, for this session, just ignore it. We don't really need to rely on that. We really just want to know the E gap. This is the raw density, uh, density functional theory band gap. Okay. Any other questions? If not, then we're going to go into our small groups, into our into the breakout rooms, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna try running these calculations for another system. Um, oh, how do we access the PowerPoint slides? They should be in in the in the. Let me show you. It's a good question. All right, they're right here. So inside of DFT VASP, you'll see that there's a set of slides here, PowerPoint, and you can get the full set of slides here. Okay. So you'll get everything, no problem. Um, okay, so we're gonna go to our, our breakout rooms and what I, okay, here's what I'm gonna say about um, these calculations. So I give you eight examples. Um, I recommend you may not have the whole time, you may not have enough time to run all of the calculations or even some of the VASP calculations. What I recommend is that you focus on creating the K points file. Um, and so I would say that the, the first few ones are very simple. Um, uh, uh, gallium arsenic is very simple. Uh, Silver is very simple. Um, iron is going to be very simple. Once you start getting to seven and eight, these are going to be very difficult. So if you're feeling adventurous in creating the K points file, I would say start with seven or eight. Otherwise, I would stick to some of the earlier ones. All right. Any other uh, questions? If not, we'll move into the, uh, I'll stop sharing and we'll move into the breakout rooms. I, uh need to move somebody into my breakout room because they're currently a little asymmetric. Uh, no problem. Let's try to come back by four, uh, 425 at the latest. Thanks. Room. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's see. So let me share my screen. Okay. So uh, I hope that some of you were able to create other uh, K points files. You might notice that, uh, let me get, uh, you might notice that the, uh, some of the other uh, systems that we did are also FCC. So I know that um, uh, gall uh, gallium arsenic was FCC. So you could have actually used the same, you could have actually used the same K points file from our example to run gallium arsenide. Um, then I think this looks, I think this is also, yes. Silver is also FCC. So you could have used the same K points file there. Um, arsenic, cobalt arsen, arsenide, arsenide looks like it's, um, I don't recall, I think it is, I don't remember which which lattice system it is. One second, let me pull up my extra slides. Oh, okay, they're right here. All right, so that system is hexagonal. So I'm not sure if anybody was able to run that one. That's hexagonal. Uh, and then iron we know is BCC. Okay, so that's what that looks like. You can see that it's, uh, it's, mag it's not only a metal since there's no band gap, but it's also magnetized because the red and the black don't overlap exactly. Okay, so there's a different density of states for upspin and downspin. Uh, ar arsenic is um, 
this one is is all is a tricky one. It's RHL. Um, just to, I just want to show you how how tricky some of these can become. So if you went to the RHL system here from the paper, you'll see that there are two variants of of RHL depending on whether alpha is less than ninety or greater than ninety. So first you have to figure that out, and then once you figure that out you'll see that the K points of RHL become very dependent on some of the lattice parameters, lattice parameters and the lattice angles here. So you have cosine of alpha, um, you have nu here, which is dependent on, on um, nu is dependent on eta here. So there's, th these can become very tedious to calculate. And you, if you have to do them by hand, you're gonna, you're gonna be making as many mistakes as I was in the, in, the, in the early session, even when it was fixed and it wasn't dependent on the lattice parameters. So these, the, you can see here, RHL2 has tan, you know, so there, there's a lot of, there's, there, it's, it can become a very tricky thing to do these, by, these things by hand. So that's why I was saying that some of the later ones are much more difficult. Arsenic is, is uh, RHL, uh, so is antimony. And, um, and uh, yeah, so the, these systems become very tricky. And with that, I think I'll conclude. Um, that wraps up our our uh, our VASP session. Um, we have a break now. We have a break for half an hour, um, and then we'll come back at three o'clock Central Daylight Savings Time um, for our last session of the day, where we talk about hopefully how to accelerate some of these very tedious uh, uh, file creations that we do with VASP, how to, how to do these things faster in a high throughput sense with A-flow. So, you know, we did, we did a lot of things by hand today. I hope that it was, it was uh, as frustrating for you as it was for me. And we're gonna show you how we can automate that process much faster. Um, and with that, I'll conclude the session. So we can, we can stop recording.